Okay. So welcome back, everyone. Thanks for staying. Uh, those of you who stayed, obviously, the ones who went, I cannot speak to them anymore. Um, thanks for your generous donations. And welcome people on Zoom here. Um, we will now start, well, first our poetic opener and then the featured reader. So the poetic opener is Sandy O'Reilly. Give her, give her a round of applause immediately. Now, I would like to tell you about how she and I recently went on a movie day. Do you, can you guess what movie Sandy and I watched together? Oh, no. <laughs> no, and and funny, that would be my reaction to that too, Sandy. No, Dune 2, of course. That's what Sandy and I are into. Right. But she doesn't want me to tell you that. She wants me to tell you this. <laughs> Sandy lives and writes on the unceded territory of the Lekwungen speaking people, the Esquimalt and Songhees nations. She has had and is still having a life full of adventures and fun, including living in several places in Canada, England, and China, standing in the DMZ between North and South Korea, that sounds adventurous, <laughs> working in the dairy of Lord Rayleigh in England, and riding Mongolian ponies on the steppes. All these experiences have contributed to her poetry, which she has been speaking at PEP for the last 10 years. She has two poems published in The Sky is Falling, The Sky is Falling, a wonderful collection of pandemic poems edited by Sheila Martindale. Okay, Sandy, I am excited to hear what you are going to read today because I was already the host the last time you were open yeah. here. I'm sure you have a completely new set. Let us hear that. <laughs> Hello, everybody in Zoom land. <laughs> um, and I'm happy to be reading here tonight with Catherine, who was one of the very first workshops I ever took when I started coming to PET. Great. I still remember it. It was great. great. Um, I have lived in lots of different places, and my two favorite places were completely polar opposites. One was Shanghai, a crazy, wild, frenetic city that was fabulous. And the other was living in the bush in the Kootenays. And this is a, some poems about life in the bush. And life in the Kootenays. Um, let's see. We bought land there with another couple. We lived fairly close to Grand Forks um, in the Kettle River Valley in the bush. We lived in the bush for a while, about eight kilometers for town, from town, just up off the highway. We lived in the forest with fir and larch and owls and jays. We lived with deer and porcupine and bear and the occasional cougar. We live with wild roses and tiger lilies and lupin and fireweed and Oregon grape and huckleberries. We live with a dog who kept the bear and strangers at bay and with feral, half feral cats who kept um, wood rats and mice at reasonable levels. We lived in a shack, a miner's cabin probably. We lived with newspaper insulation and some of the windows were car windshields. We lived with an outhouse with no door and a styrofoam seat because it didn't get cold in the winter. We lived with four or five feet of snow in the sun, summer, in the winter, and heat as thick as fleece in the summertime. We lived with kerosene lanterns and homemade candles. Uh, we lived with um, water, or we lived with, oh God, in the wintertime, we hauled five gallon pails of water from town and melted snow for dishes. The first few years we lived there, we didn't have a tractor to plow the driveway into our place. So we parked up on the gazetted road above and made a trail down the hill and through the trees to the cabin. Mike Barnholden gave us a propane cook stove and a hundred pound tank. We thought we'd won the lottery. Happiness is relative. The first year the tank emptied was in the winter. So we just tied it up and lowered it over the bank and picked it up from the side of the highway on the way into town. When we came back, we parked up above, lashed it to the bargain, and rode it down the hill and through the trees of the cabin. We were crazy. We were young. <laughs> One of the things I loved about the Kootenays was we really had seasons. They were very distinct. They came and did their job and moved on and let the next season take over. Not like here. The spring goes on forever. It refuses to give up winter and it will not allow summer to get here. Spring in the interior. A filigree of corn snow padded by the sun, coffee on the back steps, turned full face into the warmth, breathing with the rhythm of the snow melting off the roof. The kids unzip, orbiting and ever widening circles, flinging off coats, mitts, and scarves as they fly, pure, plain joy. 
the this was called they called this valley in the Kettle River the Sunshine Valley. So there was sun all the time, even during the winter. After it snowed, we had fabulous sun and sun in the summer. It was hot in the summer and dry. Hot like the heat dome we had here a couple of years ago, only it went on for weeks, not for a couple of days. And although I don't think I could stand that now, I loved it at the time, August. We are held in August by the blue sky and the thick heat. The firs are hangdog and the alders are frozen in it. The blossoms are all gone from the wild roses, but the hips are fat and soaking up vitamin C for winter tea. The wood is dry and chapped and warm to the touch. The smell of hot metal rolls off the car and off the tractor and the plow in the back of the tractor. The sounds of the afternoon are small, the pop and snap of grasshopper, the lazy hum of horse flies and the crackle of sear August grasses. I finish hanging the laundry and sit on the chopping block in the shade with a can of iced tea. I roll it across my forehead and up and down my arms trying to absorb some of the cold. And I watch the kids playing in and out of the sandbox and the old wash tub half full of water. Content, cocooned, I thought I could live here forever, but there is no forever. This is all gone, we are all gone, living in different places, doing different things, but on any hot day, I can get that feeling back. Paradoxically, one of the weird things about living in the bush is where you can't see your neighbors or even throw stones to their house, is that you become a community. And you get to know each other far more than you do in the city where you can smell each other's breakfast and hear each other breathing and sleep at night. We became friends and did all kinds of things together, had all kinds of parties, did things with our kids. And one of the things we did regularly was get wood in for the winter, late October. We were across the highway on the Crown land, a group of us with pickup trucks and our tractor, because on the Crown land, we can take any standing dead or any fallen timber. We buck up fir and larch and pine and sometimes poplar, which really smell the bad when it's wet. We cram every last twig into the pickup trucks, drink beer and eat cheese sandwiches, watch the kids play in the bush and on and off the tractor. Back home, even though it's just October, we stoke up the stove and the frost disappears into the trees with the owls and the larch lightning blazes one last time as we wait for the sun to drop behind the mountain like a stone. Grand Forks is at about 1,700 feet, and we lived at about 3,000. So there was often quite a difference between when the snow came in the fall and when it left in spring. Sometimes there was still snow on the north sides of buildings and bushes in May. Um, and this is just sort of how the snow came. November the 9th, cold and blowing snow in town. When I finished my shift at Gilly's hamburger joint at 9 p.m., crammed into the snowmobile suit, I jump on the little 50cc Honda and head home all the way up Spencer Hill, the road coming and going in the fat flakes. When I reach our turnoff, the snow is a lot thicker and coming a lot faster. And then I know that this is winter. This snow will not be melting. At home, I put the bike away in the shed the last time I'll ride it this year. It's a dark in the bush at night and quiet. And I stand in that dark and that quiet for a few minutes and just listen to the snow falling. I put my head back and stick out my tongue and taste the first flakes, the amuse bush of winter. Um, it's starting to get cold, but I'm still just standing there. The dog snorts in her dream and I give my head a shake. I can feel the cold start to creep along my skin now and I move into the warmth. Um, we had a lot of winter actually, but I really loved it because the sun came out all the time. And of course we did all the winter things. Our kids, we had a slight, slope between our place and our, our land partner's house and the kids actually built their own ski jump there. They spent most of their lives outside summer and winter and I'm actually really grateful for that. Um, winter in the Kootenays. Cold outside and cold inside the, uh, the newspaper insulated cabin. We're sitting around the wood stove cranked right up with heavy wool socks and cups of hot chocolate in our hands, laughing and joking and telling stories, wondering when the ski will be able to open this year, if it will get cold enough to put stuff out on the porch and let it freeze all winter, if the styrofoam really will be warm enough to sit on. Um, and through the one window that we haven't completely covered, the moonlight just makes a run for the center of all of us, for the fire in the middle of us sitting there, even silver can be soft.
And most of BC and actually a lot of Canada, it's just a series of small towns in between bigger places. And on the way to Vancouver from Grand Forks, there's Grand Forks and then there's Greenwood and then there's Midway and then there's Rock Creek. And between Rock Creek and the Soyuz is a small town called Bridesville. It had a few buildings. I never stopped there, but I never saw another person there. And I hardly ever even saw any cars on the road. And I'm going to end with this poem. And I call it Bridesville. Now the sun, the snow lays flat all across these soft little hills. The wind whips, whips across the valley and hardens the snow. It gives a little crunch to the winter. Some wayward bushes and errant grasses stick up, stand still and wait for spring. The blue sky touches everything. I love this place, this small oasis of silence. <laughs>